You may be seated. As you are, let's pray together. Our loving and gracious God, Almighty Father, we thank you for this time which we gather this day, confessing our deep need for you, our longing, God, for your touch in our lives. We lift up, God, this moment in which we might hear and receive from Scripture as your Holy Spirit speaks to us. May we hear the word that we must hear this day, and may we hear it and obey. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In two weeks, on the 7th of May, we're going to be launching the Sunday Cafe. What is the Sunday Cafe, you ask? After, on the first Sunday of the month, after worship, we'll be inviting everybody in worship to come down the hallway, this way, the mystery hallway, to the Upper Fine Center, and we're going to have food and coffee and time for fellowship together after worship is over. So we're going to not try to squeeze 20 of you in the foyer to have that kind of coffee connection time. Now, the reason we're doing that and going to try to do that once a month is because we're trying to help all of us as a congregation to be together and what it's like to be together. A lot of these practices we had before the pandemic, and the pandemic has now come and it's waning, but still present among us. And in some ways, we, along with many churches, haven't reclaimed some of these practices that we keep about how we gather together, how we uh, hang out, if you will. And then there's other ways we do that more deeply. We do that deeply in things like small groups and places where we can share our life and discipleship together. We're going to be launching five new small groups in the life of our church over the next week or so. And so we're hopeful that you'll be engaged in that and prayerfully reflect about how you can participate. So many ways that we as a church are trying to reconstitute ourselves, to, to be together other than just this time of worship here in the sanctuary on a Sunday or watching it and participating in worship live uh, at home or maybe later in the week by watching it in the live stream. All of these practices of gathering back together and finding ways to be in connection with one another are really about helping us emerge even, I would say, unexpectedly slow from the isolation of pandemic. I still believe that so many of us live lives that are conditioned and adapted to the way we lived in isolation. And so we as a church have to be in a place where we're helping ourselves reclaim what it is to be together as a community of people. And part of this for me is the belief that the world today is starved for community, starved for relationships, starved to be in connection with one another and with God. And so we have to learn how to do that again as a church so that we can have an opportunity to invite those not in a church to be a part of that community that is life-giving and preaches and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I find, at least in my experience, that there's a lot of folks today, and many of them, that are living in a heads-down sort of world. You know, heads-down, go about my business, I'm doing what I need to do, they're focused deliberately on the task in front of them, and not necessarily paying much attention to the human beings that are around them all the time. This story in the Gospel of Luke, this walk to Emmaus story as you've heard it, is filled with two individuals who are living in a heads down sort of world. This story takes place on Easter Sunday. Many of these stories take place on that same very day of Jesus' resurrection. This particular story takes place in the afternoon. It's made up of two individuals walking on a road that goes from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And these two individuals are not two of Jesus' 12 disciples. These are some other followers or disciples of Jesus who are on this road going from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They've heard about the resurrection. They've heard that the body of Jesus isn't there. They've heard from Mary Magdalene who went to the tomb and even Jesus appeared to her. 
They've heard all of these things, but they said, ah, I'm going to go home. And that's what they end up doing, walking down a road. They have a lot of disappointment. They have dreams that are unfulfilled. They cannot function in a world of contradiction, and they don't know how to hold that tension very well. Because on one hand, they believe Jesus to be the Messiah, the one who would come to liberate the Jewish people and to lead them to a new age of independence on the one hand. And yet he was executed and killed by virtue of crucifixion through the Roman authorities and the religious leaders of his day. They cannot hold that tension. They do not understand how those two things can actually work together. They just don't get it. And so faced with their disappointment and their discouragement and their inability to hold contradiction, they simply go home. And then a stranger meets them on the road. And the stranger that meets them is Jesus, but he's unrecognizable to them. They don't know who he is, even though it's him. And as Jesus walks along the road with them, they have this exchange and an encounter that ends in a beautiful moment. And so I want to talk with you today about this, about how we go from living in a heads-down world to living in a world that is life lifted up. Now, in this heads-down world, we want to hear a little bit about what a heads-down world is like for them. It says that they were downtrodden, or they had their heads bowed to the ground, quite literally. And then Jesus joins them. They don't know who he is. And Jesus says, uh, what are you all talking about? And they, uh, they say, well, are you the only one in all of Jerusalem that hasn't heard about what's gone on over these days? And then Jesus says in verse 19, what sort of things? And they said to him, those about Jesus the Nazarene who proved to be a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. See, that's the tension. The, they can't handle the contradiction. Indeed, besides all this, let's go to the next slide. There we go. It is now the third day since these things have happened. But also some women among us left us bewildered when they went to the tomb early in the morning, and they did not find his body. They came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels that said he was alive. And so some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it just exactly as the woman had also said, but him they did not see. And so we all went home. That's how this story plays out. So they retell the story to this Jesus walking with them that they don't recognize, and it reveals everything. Not only can they not handle contradiction, can they not handle their own disappointment and discouragement, they choose to no longer be in community together because they can't hold all of this. The trauma of what they've experienced has fractured their community. You understand, they're leaving Jerusalem. They're going home. They're figuring this, this Jesus was just a sham. You know, in the period 150 years before Jesus, and the period of about 40 years after Jesus, there were no less than seven individuals who claimed to be the Messiah that led a revolt against the Roman Empire. And so they just figured that Jesus was one of those. Another failed attempt at leading the Jews to their own form of religious independence. The last one that tried this in about 68 AD, which is maybe about a little short of 40 years after this episode happened, angered the Romans so much that in 68, the Roman army came into Jerusalem, sacked the city, burned the Jewish temple to the ground and dismantled it, drove all the Jews out of the city, pursued them down into the Dead Sea and the Jordan River Valley, and the Jews took refuge at a mountain fortress called the Masada, where they made their last stand. The Romans were so intent on getting to the Jews, they took them two years to build a siege works that could get up to Masada so they could kill all of the Jews that remained. That's how bad it got. So how do we turn that into something else? How does Jesus in this very simple story in Luke's gospel change everything from them living in a heads down sort of world to living a life lifted up? in which their hearts are lifted. How do we go from A to B? Well, there's some keys in the story that I want us to take a look at for a moment. 
to see about how we move from one place to the other place, how we go from this heads-down world of kind of disappointment, disillusionment, inability to handle contradiction, to live in a different sort of way. And there are some good clues in this story, not just clues, good teaching in this story. The first one is in verse 18. And it's this one. It's that our perspective is only one part of the story. Our perspective is only one part of the story. Luke 24, 18. This is when one of the two individuals is talking with Jesus before they recognize him. And they say to him, when Jesus asks, what are you all talking about? He says, are you possibly the only one living near Jerusalem who does not know about the things that happened here in these days? Not only is the question rhetorical, it's condescending, isn't it? Are you the only one who hasn't heard what's gone on? Are you the only one who didn't see the Chicago Cubs blow a perfect game in the eighth inning because they couldn't feel the ground ball this week? Some of you are saying, I don't know what he's talking about. What is he talking about? Go watch the video. It's epic. The condescension in their rhetorical question is just thick. And Jesus opens them up by asking, what are y'all talking about? Tell me more. I'd like to listen to that. Can you say something else? Do you see how the posture they come at Jesus is with condescension? And the posture Jesus comes to them is with curiosity, inquisitiveness, wondering, two very different mindsets. And so we have to remember that our perspective is only one part of the story. So there are times at which we need to allow ourselves to set aside whatever assumptions and prejudices we carry with ourselves, just kind of sizing people up by the way they look or the way they sound or the way they speak. And instead say, tell me more. I'd like to hear more about that. What are you talking about? I'm curious. When we assume that sort of posture, it's the posture then of assuming that we only have one part of the story and that other people have other part of the story and we probably should listen to that. So a question I want you to wonder about this week is this. What relationship in our life needs a fresh perspective? In other words, where have you already kind of sized it up and decided what you've decided about it? Where do you need to maybe go back to it and say, ah, maybe I need to look at this again. Maybe I need to ask more questions. Maybe I need to probe a little bit more deeply. The second way in which Jesus helps us understand a life lift, lifted up in this story is in verse 27. He says that we, in many ways, need to revisit things you think you already know. Revisit things you think you already know. It says in Luke 24, 27, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. So even though these two people had walked around with Jesus for some amount of time, we don't know, Jesus' earthly ministry was about three years long. Even though they were with him for some kind of moment in that, they still didn't comprehend exactly what Jesus was talking about. And so Jesus has to go back and tell them everything from Moses to the prophets. That's pretty much the entire Bible for them. And explain the story again. He has them revisit things they think they already know. Now, this is key for us as followers of Jesus to listen to. That gaining knowledge of Scripture can lead us to a place of arrogance. Knowledge lacking wisdom is dangerous. And so what happens for us oftentimes within the Christian community is that we believe that after a certain amount of time that we amass an amount of biblical or theological knowledge or we worship in a building week after week after week, thinking that being in the building makes us Christian just as much going home and standing in your garage makes you a car. <laughs> what we lose sight of in this arc is that we think we know a lot. And so what's worse, 
Is it worse to be deceived or to be wrong? You see, the deception is filled with a sense of arrogance, and, and that's what happens for these two people on the road to Emmaus when they say, are you the only one who hasn't heard about this? They come at it from a standpoint of condescension because they think they know it all. And Jesus is helping them understand, you don't know it all. As a matter of fact, you don't know anything. I'm starting over at the beginning and walking you through all of these different truths. Yeah, let me give you an example. Is sometimes um, when we talk about the Bible, for example, uh, we talk about the Bible as if the Bible itself teaches us something. I want you to pause for a minute. The Bible itself teaches us something. Friends, that's a theologically incorrect statement. The Bible teaches us nothing. The Holy Spirit teaches us through the Bible. God speaks through the Word. When we give credit to the book for things that God is actually the one responsible for doing, we've conflated the book and God. They are not the same. The scriptures tell us the story. They explain to us truth. But the transforming power of God works through the scripture. We are not bibliolaters. We are followers of the living God who has revealed himself supremely in Jesus Christ, revealed to us in the scripture. Revisit the things you think you already know. Because to be honest with you, over the years of my life, I've had a practice of keeping a morning devotional time, and I read a passage of scripture every day during my time for morning devotion. I'm, hap I'd be hap I'm happening to read 1 and 2 Corinthians right now. That's not the first time I've read 1 and 2 Corinthians. I've actually read those books in my daily devotional at least two or three times before in my lifetime for my devotional reading. But yet every time I read it, that those letters of Paul, something new jumps out at me. I hear something new. I learn something new. Something happens that causes me to see it in a different sort of way. Did the words on the paper change? What changed? The Holy Spirit of God has sanctified and changed me so that when I read those words, I read them differently now. I see them differently. New truth comes to me because God speaks to me. It's such a powerful truth for us to remember that the same Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write those words down is the same Holy Spirit in me when I read it. That's the continuity. It's not the ink on the paper. It's the Spirit of God that speaks and moves over centuries and times and epochs and ages, the eternal God that is always faithful. I'd encourage you to try a new practice this week. And it's something that I started uh, a few weeks ago. I picked up a new app I put on my phone. It's called Lectio 365. I didn't put it on the screen because I didn't want to make it easy for you. If you want to write it down, Lectio, and here's how you spell it, L-E-C-T-I-O 365. In the app, every day, there is a morning and evening prayer time. It functions like a little 10-minute podcast, but it uses a spiritual practice called the Lectio Divina, in which you'll sit for 10 minutes, you'll start the audio and listen to it, and they'll read the scripture several times so that you can reflect on it. And they give you some prompts for prayer and allow you to sit quietly with the text. It's really a wonderful way to access the scripture speaking in a way that maybe you haven't before. So I'd encourage you to give it a try. Revisit the things you already know. So the question I might wonder about with you this week is, what familiar truth in your faith needs to be revisited? 
what familiar truth in your faith needs to be revisited. Now, there's, there's more ways in which our hearts are lifted up in this story of the road to Emmaus. And the next one is to learn to hold wonder and contradiction. And that also goes back to C number one. Number one was what? Our perspective is only one part of the story. Learn to hold wonder and contradiction. It says in Luke 24, 29 this, and they strongly urged him saying, stay with us for it's getting toward evening. The day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. So they're walking down the road. Jesus is walking with two of them. They don't recognize it's Jesus. They're ready to stop for the night. Jesus looks like he's going to keep going down the road. And they say, whoa, 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 hold on, Jesus. Stay with us for it's getting toward evening. Do you see what's happened to them as Jesus has been talking to them? Their own curiosity is coming alive. Their own sense of wonder is beginning to burst. They want him to stay because they want more. They want to know more. They want to hear more. They want to experience more more of what Jesus has to offer. So when the two retell Jesus about what happened in Jerusalem, they cannot hold contradiction, and so they go home. But Jesus opens a new understanding of the scripture, so their wonder is renewed. Here's the newsflash, brothers and sisters. Things don't need to be solved and reasoned. Things don't need to be solved or reasoned. Say it with me. Things don't need to be solved or reasoned. Sometimes we need to acknowledge that our role is not to fix things or fix people. That's God's responsibility to fix people. What matters is staying in the conversation, keeping it going, never giving up on each other, never quitting on each other always looking upon one another with deep affection and grace, humility and kindness, never speaking hurtful words to one another, but only speaking graceful words to each other so that the conversation keeps going. When we speak hurtful words and angry words and, and venomous words to one another, it ends the conversation. It stops the exchange. It ends community. This is why as Christians, we stand so strongly against violence, not only physical violence, but also verbal violence, because it destroys the very fabric of community. Learn to hold contradiction means I'm going to hold this together even if I don't understand it yet, even if I don't get it, even if it doesn't compute yet. I'm simply going to hold it in my hands for a little bit and hold it in my heart and head, knowing that God will help me get there one way or another. So a question you might want to wonder about this week is what is the Spirit's growing edge in your life? And how are you spending time with Him there? Growing edge means that edge in your life that you haven't really figured out yet, you haven't really resolved yet, that you wonder about. How are you going to spend time with that? Two more keys to this story, and we'll finish for the morning. Luke 24, 32 is the next one. Discover God in doing. It says in verse 32, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? You see, they don't actually see Jesus until something happens. When they are going down the road, it looks like Jesus is going to go on further. They beg him to stay, so they come in and they stay somewhere, and then they sit down for a meal. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, who has been their guest, and they don't even know who he is, he all of a sudden becomes the host. He picks up the bread, he takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. And as soon as he gives them the bread, they go, we've seen this before. We've seen him take bread, bless it, break it, and give it when he fed 5,000. We've seen him take bread, bless it, and break it, and give it to his disciples in the upper room. We've seen this before. You see, it's the action. It's the kinetic. It's the thing that happens that is the breakthrough for them. They get it when they do it. They don't get it when they 
just ponder on it only. They get it when they do it. You see, their vision is restored when they see him do something familiar, something they have known him to do before. So it's the doing that's the breakthrough. And so oftentimes what happens is we fear to take certain action because it's just safer to stay in. We fear taking the next step in anything in our lives at times because it's safer to stay where we are. And God is inviting all of us to take that next step. Yeah, a little bit of uncertainty, a little little bit of fear and trepidation. But ultimately, that's, that's what faith is. It's taking the step when we're not quite sure, when we're not quite certain of what life needs to look like. We have to set aside inner doubt and contradictions, and our hearts will burn within us when we do it. That's my favorite part of the story. Were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road? So as soon as they knew that it was Jesus, they said, we should have known it was him. We should have known we were talking to Jesus. What a wonderful testimony of Wesleyan prevenient grace. God is at work in our lives before we're even aware of it. This is the hallmark of Wesleyan Methodist theology, that God is at work in every single life out there, in here and out there. Every human heart, God is at work in everybody's life right now. And then there will come a moment we pray for every single human being where they'll say, we're not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us. You see, we don't have an awareness that God is speaking to us until after God has spoken. Then we hear it. Then we can see it. Then we can grasp it and hold it. Friends, discover God in doing. Take a step. Take a step. A question to wonder about this week. It's a hard one. You're not going to like it. Where does spiritual laziness need to find action in your life? All right, and the last one. There's actually 20 of them, but I distilled it to five. <laughs> Luke 24, 35. It says that they began to relate their experience on the road and how he was recognized by them at the breaking of the bread. Share the story to lift others up. You see, the retelling of the story encourages us and others. And so they go back to Jerusalem after they realize they've met the risen Lord Jesus on that first Easter day, and they go back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples. Now, the story chronologically, as we've told them over the last couple of weeks, these are all out of order. They happen on Easter day. So the story, the day plays out like this. In the morning, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. She finds it empty. She goes and tells the disciples. Peter and this other disciple come back to the tomb. They also see it empty, and they go home. Mary Magdalene stays. Jesus appears to her. She has this conversation with him. Jesus says, go back and tell my disciples that you've seen me. So she goes back and tells them that she's seen them. The response of these two disciples in this story is they go, "Eh," and they go home. As they go home on Sunday afternoon, this stranger meets them on the road. And when the stranger meets them on the road, they have this long conversation. It gets close to dinner time. They decide to stop so they can sit for the evening meal. Jesus then breaks the bread. He appears in their midst. They recognize it's him. We're not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road. They went back to Jerusalem. They told the disciples. When they got there, they told the disciples. The disciples tell them, those two, Cleopas and this other guy, that Jesus had also appeared to Peter. I hope you've read all four Gospels, but we never read the story of Jesus appearing to Peter. All we know from Luke's Gospel is that apparently sometime on that Easter day, Jesus appeared to Peter as well. And so then they're all hanging out in the room. Thomas goes to the 7-Eleven to get some milk, and then Jesus appears in the room to all the disciples. That's how the day plays out. That's Easter Sunday. Pretty awesome day, wouldn't you say? That's how the day plays out. 
So when they start sharing their stories of meeting Jesus, what happens? It becomes a form of mutual encouragement. And once they're encouraged by one another's stories, then Jesus appears. Once they share their stories, then Jesus appears. I'm just going to say it again. Once they share their stories together, then Jesus appears. This week, we're going to be sending out to you information about the five small groups we're going to be starting in our church. They're Wesleyan small groups, class meetings. We have a cool name for them, don't worry. Those are places where we can share our stories of Jesus because that's what's going to lift one another up. We already have a lot of that happening in our church, don't we? There are some of you who've been involved in some of our adult classes like Samaritans or Koinonia or Journey for years, the women's Bible study that meets on Wednesday morning, the men's Zoom group that happens on Wednesday, the men's group that meets Friday morning for breakfast. There's a lot of you getting together to talk. We have to relearn how to do all that. Pandemic has wrecked us spiritually, emotionally, and physically, as we know. So we have to go back to the things we think we know and learn how to be God's people together again. In our worship service, we have time to break bread together and we have time to share the peace where we turn to one another and say, may the peace of Christ be with you and people respond and also with you. Or you say, hey, good morning. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Does that feel normal yet? Does that feel natural yet? Hmm. Let's pray. Lord God, we come together as people this morning in deep need of your touch, deep need of your grace. We've grown more accustomed than we think to living in a heads-down world. Are you the only one that hasn't heard of the pandemic? Oh, God, we pray for your strengthening and renewing power to be in our midst today. We're so thankful, so thankful for your presence that constantly invites us to be deeper community, deeper in connection to one another, whether it be in small groups, the Sunday cafe, or classes that are going to happen even today after worship in the sanctuary has ended. Whatever it is, God, you're inviting us to be community together. Because each and every one of us recognize that Jesus, your son, is in our midst. We're not our hearts burning within us while he spoke with us. So, Lord, we pray today that you give us the very strength we need to step into this uncertain season with confidence in the knowledge that your spirit walks before us. Bless us, God, this day as we gather around this table in which we remember how Jesus took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And how when the supper was over, the Lord Jesus took the cup, and after he returned thanks to you, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, God, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We pray, God, that you would help us to recognize your very son Jesus in the breaking of the bread and send us forth from this place with burning hearts. This we pray and ask in his mighty name as he taught us to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.